Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to World Builders Weekly. Hello. Woo it's been a little bit for me. I'm Jamie. I'm the Director of Community Engagement. New title alert. Woo uh, and this week, we've got an awesome episode of World Builders Weekly. I am joined by Aaron and Leader Games. Aaron, introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. My name's Aaron, and I'm the community manager at Elodin. So by day, I'm your friendly neighborhood CM working alongside Pat Rothfuss. And by night, uh, I'm a published game designer and podcaster. Go to curtaincall.games if you want to see what I'm working on. But uh, we're not talking about that today. We have some awesome guests today. Uh, Jamie already said, Cole and Patrick from Later Games. I, I am a little starstruck. I'm so happy to be on the stream with them today. Welcome both of you. And we will uh, get to introducing kind of you guys and your roles at Leader um, once we get through a few quick announcements. We wanted to make sure that everybody at home knows a few things. The first is our upcoming guests on World Builders Weekly. We have an awesome slate of folks uh, waiting in the, are, are on, on call, we on that. Um, but next week is SB Divya. We have a whole, all of March is all scheduled out. So make sure you're here Tuesdays at noon central time. And we will be here with awesome authors and geeks to chat it up. Uh, music? What does it say? Um, <laughs> For the market, World Builders Market, if you have tried to buy something on the market recently or you try to buy something now and it has some sort of variant, like in color or like a signed version or not signed version, Shopify is having a moment. We're trying to help out, but we're not really sure what the problem is. Uh, we're working to fix it, so sit tight with us. But there is absolutely no problem at all right now with buying Root, the game that we are talking about the expansion for today. And if you pick up a copy of Root, that automatically qualifies you for our $60 or more bonus gift for this month, which is an amazing art calendar. It's essentially an art print with a bonus calendar. So you use it to plan for a month. And then when the month is over, you slice it off, put it in a frame or poster tack it up and you've got beautiful art that was free with your game or with your $60 or more purchase at the market. So um check it out we're we'll, we'll let you know when we've got spotify updates but sit tight with us thank you so much for your patience all right moving right on through we are going from announcements into trivia aaron would you mind reading the old trivia question for us oh boy would i i'd love this trivia question so uh you may notice it, i am a star wars fan uh which this is pretty apropos. Let's see. The old trivia question was, what phrase uttered by Greedo and Sebulba in Star Wars means, this will be the end of you? Now, this one you can put in chat because this is our old uh, answer. Hopefully, you sent it in by DM already to be entered to win our trivia prize of the month. Um, but the answer is, Aaron? McClunky. McClunky. This will be the end of you. Bonus points if you can use that in conversation today. I task you. Use McClunky in conversation, and uh, we, we probably won't give you anything for it, but I'll give you like a virtual high five. Just like send it out into the atmosphere, and I'll know it's happened. If you manage to put McClunky in conversation and can tell me what you said, the, like the little context of it, I will give you two entries for trivia. Double oh, trivia. Right. Right. Boom. Nice. All right. So this is our new trivia question. It means no answers in chat. <laughs> Only in DMs. Every DM enters you for our trivia championship of the month uh, for March. So here is our next question. Dr. Strange earned his name before he ever learned magic. Which kind of doctor is he? An MD? or a PhD. What kind of doctor is Dr. Strange? Send that in a message to us and uh, we will enter you to win the trivia prize. All right, I think that's all the announcements and trivia updates. We're getting right into the good juicy stuff because we're so excited 
to be chatting with Leader Games today. Um, I'll do a little read through of just kind of the, the general gist of the game. Uh, Root is a fully asymmetric strategy board game designed by Cole Werrell, lavishly illustrated by Kyle Farron, and brought to life by the team at Leader Games. In Root, the players drive the narrative and the differences among roles create unparalleled interaction and replayability. Since 2014, Leader Games has been building immersive designs that put players first. Uh, they've been creating socially conscious games that reward replete, repeat play and study. They're meant to be enjoyed over and over and over again, not kind of play it, oh, I got it, we're done. So uh, first off, let's introduce our, our guests fully. Patrick, can you uh, give us a quick introduction what you do at Leader? Uh, I play Stellaris a lot and some Doom, <laughs> Doom 2. Um, that's my job at, at Leader Games. No, um, yeah, I, I'm the, uh, I'm currently the CEO, or I, it's as much as I can legally say I'm the CEO, because that's actually a specific title. Uh, and I run the company. Uh, I do all the hiring and business development and, um, about half my week is spent doing game design also. So I do, I, I do a little bit of that. Uh, mostly I manage operations right now as, uh, as we transition to a larger team and uh, feed the creative team ideas and do some play testing with them. So it's been, do a little bit of everything all day. Um, so cat herding and game design as well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's, about what, that's the ideal I'm describing right now. We'll, we'll uh, I don't know what I said up there, so. And Doom 2. And, and Doom, Doom 2. 2, yeah, you no. can't you can't forget Doom 2. And I'm talking 1994, Doom 2, not not uh, not, not uh, eternal. Yeah. Not not any of your new not any of your new Dooms. No, no. So, which <laughs> new I fangled Dooms. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. That's... Well, thank you so much for joining us, Patrick and Cole. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I also spend about half of my week working on game design, and the other half I spend just doing mostly project management and making sure that all the games get done and coordinating the creative teams. Uh, at, at a studio of about our size, we usually have three or four things in development at any one time, and these games take a long time to make. I mean, most of the titles, uh, by the time they've come up, we might have been working on them for 18 months or so, so there's a long uh, you know, back end process, and I try try my best to make sure it goes smoothly, and we get the everybody, everybody their game on time. Awesome. Well, very cool. So let's get into it. You are currently running a Kickstarter. Um, there is, and it is called the Marauder expansion. Can you give us like your quick kind of elevator pitch for Root and the the Marauder expansion? What it kind of adds on to the game? You want me to do the factions, and you can do the hirelings, Cole. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, I think the kind of the core of every expansion experience is that we do, uh, we do add two factions to the game. Um, I guess we've kind of focused on one, what we call militant faction in that, in that, in that universe, which is a faction that has um, a lot of troops on the board, a lot of presence on the board and can manipulate the board, kind of polices the, the state of the game. And then we do one counterinsurgent faction, which is true for the previous two expansions. This expansion, though, both are the militant faction. So we've, we've, we've built the game around these two uh, militant factions or the expansion on these two militant factions uh, with the idea that um, when you're playing two player, then you will have more options because you need to use a militant faction. Currently, we don't know if that question might be changing now, right? Or the answer might be changing soon. Uh, so you, you currently have to play the game with, uh, if you're playing two player with two militant factions squaring off, there was only three options before. Now let's expand that out to five, which I think is going to provide a lot more options for the two or three player uh, game. And then filling out two player, we also are building. So we have this other system called the hireling system that we are mm -hmm. putting into the game. And the, the intent behind the system is, it has a lot of different things that it's doing to the game. So on the one hand, it really helps those lower player count games feel like higher player count games. So it really flushes out the games two and three player, but you can use the hirelings throughout all the counts. One of the other things uh, the hirelings do is they allow players who want just more root, more of the world of root on their table to really populate the map. So, you know, one of the things that I remember Kyle, um, when I was talking with the artist Kyle Farron, uh, he said that, you know, one, one of uh, one of his regrets in like the, the aesthetic design of Root is that you only get to see the cats or the birds in like one or two poses. Uh, and that, you know, this is a whole kingdom and it's getting summed up by just one one figurehead. 
and the hirelings are allowing us to really explore the world that he is he's constructed and to put a lot more just of his art and of his character into the game uh, and so for folks like wanting just more more world or more powers in their game the hirelings give them a lot of material to work with i love the art style of this game it's very it's very nostalgic for me because I grew up reading Redwall so it gives me a lot of those old school vibes but just like a very warm but not overly cartoonish style I think it's amazing so just it's like if Richard Scary had some teeth yeah like if Richard yeah. Scary was like we're we're gonna get competitive about this <laughs> I love it that's a great what isn't I mean what's not competitive about pigs making sausages I mean that's a pretty brutal universe that, that Richard's putting in front of us. <laughs> that is a pretty brutal universe, definitely. Uh, do you want to hit some questions, Aaron? Yeah, I, I, I have so many questions because I remember, I think two years ago at Gen Con, I believe that's when Root first came out. And every single person I spoke to was like, hey, have you played Root? And I'm like, you're the 10th person to ask me this. I've seen plushies everywhere. Everyone's playing this game. And I probably spent um, my first night at Gen Con playing nothing but Root. And what I noticed was playing one faction, uh, even three, four, five times, you, you learn something every single time you play. And one of the things I love about your company is that you, you reward that continued play experience. Uh, what is the, the idea behind making something with such a long tail on it? Is that something that you intended or did you oops into that during development? Well, partly it has to do with the fact that we have to play these games more than almost anybody else in the world, right? <laughs> so if, we, if we're going to have to play this game 100 or 200 times, it should be worth our time if we want it to be worth the, the time of other folks. And so I feel like, you know, it, there's a little bit of attention actually in it because sometimes, and you can see this in certain game designs, uh, that you, you can, like, I, I always, when I'm looking at a game, I'll, I'll, I'll think to myself, if the designer was designing for just their play testers, or if they were actually thinking about going outside of it, because you can fall in this really scary loop where you're making it more interesting for yourself, but you're not really looking out. And so our play testing process tries to marry uh, really dedicated core groups that are gonna play the game a lot with a constant inflow of new people so that we make sure we're also like not overwhelming the, those people. Uh, I know when we were first working on Root, Patrick would always tell me that every faction should be able to be played at least three ways. They should have kind of like three different strategic archetypes. And a lot of that ethos was carried through in the design of every single faction. Like the, you know, the, the I feel like w w we're successful in, uh, I know the development is nearing completion, maybe I'll put it that way. If after playing a game, someone says, I can't wait to just play this exact same game again. Like they, they don't even want to change the faction that they're playing. They just want to further understand the faction that they just experienced. Um, and, and that shows that the asymmetry is actually giving us something as opposed to it just being like, um, I don't know, like a carnival where you want to visit every stall. Absolutely. Or, or the player just saying, well, we got that done. I, yeah. People ask me a lot in AMAs and things like that, how do we know when to ship fast and how do we know when to ship root? And I think that is the... For me, what Colda said is the is, that is the line right there. That moment where you finish and you're like, I don't care that it's ten o'clock at night. I want to play again right now, and and that's it's really cool. We're kind of we're like I think Cole and I are kind of talking about this internally right now too, and it's interesting is that there is a question about how do we grow if we decide to grow, and or do we you know just more carefully define people's roles within the company. And I, I um, and that that question of, or that like premise of like how do we continue? That's the product we want. We want to make something that is that is that is played over and over, and can we deliver that with a larger group of people? And I I I don't know if that's true. And like and and so like the the level of care that we can give right now, even if we hire more people it's not there is there's an arithmetic there it's not if we get if we get if we double the team we get twice as many games i'm worried at the same quality i think there's i think there would be a change in quality and so we have to we have to consider about how we have to consider that when we ask ourselves the question about how we're going to grow from here so sorry i'm getting a little out on tangent there i was just, I was just <laughs> no, thinking about it <laughs> no this is great this i is love fantastic. hearing it especially i helped with the um game development a long time ago of a game that the company i was working for was making and one of my major roles was planning the play testing 
And boy, did I learn over time that like you need those fresh eyes and you need your veterans who are like mm -hmm. really familiar with game design. Both are so valuable because like you said, you can just design yourself into a hole and then somebody new pulls this game out and looks at it and is like, what is going on? Because it's just gotten too abstract for them. So that's awesome. Um, forgot my other question. Aaron, take it away. Uh, so... One of the things that I love about about all of your games is that they have a very specific vibe. You know, we we said Richard scary with some teeth, and then we kind of delved into well, that's kind of a scary word at, at world anyway. Um, but Kyle's art style has such a childlike wonder for such a deep game. Um, is is that something that you're actively thinking about while you're developing? Are you are you thinking like, oh, the art's going to look really good if we use this type of militant faction? Are 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 you thinking we have all these woodland critters? What if we make this one like really have an edge to it? Does that influence design at all for you? Uh, go ahead, Cole. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I can talk all day about this. So <clears throat> one of the key things that is different about this little company versus pretty much any other game company in the board game space is that almost everybody's full-time and that includes Kyle. So he's a staff member. He is, he goes to the weekly meeting and when we're at the very early stages of a project, he is in those conversations. And so, you know, it, it's not as if like we come up with, with, with the design and then we find like the right artist for it. I think when we're in those early creative stages of, of figuring out what a project is going to look like, I want to, I want Kyle's input. You know, when we were working on, uh, we just finished this, this really big game oath that we'll be shipping to backers hopefully for pretty soon. And I'm excited. I'm waiting on it, my and copy. It, and, it, and it doesn't look like root. It doesn't look like root at all. <laughs> yeah. But in those early conversations, like Kyle and I were talking a lot about the novels that we were reading and the, you know, the, the kind of world vibes that we were getting. And then also like, I knew that that game was going to be a little heavier than root and it was going to be a little meaner than root. If that, if that, is possible and so the, the art has to counterbalance that and harmonize with it and so we, we kind of came up with this aesthetic rule of like the black cauldron by way of jim henson and, and, and that is that is an aesthetic that is uh that the game design leans on but also that kyle uh was excited to like work in that space right and you know you, you can see like the very kenneth graham when in the willows and the red wall vibes and the disney's robin hood vibes in roots art which is also like working towards an end. I mean, one of the things that I think, and, and this wasn't precisely planned, but I, th I do think this was a consequence of it. Uh, Root can be quite an aggressive game, uh, but the art like softens the blow. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's the opposite of like a game like um, Eric Lang's Blood Rage, which is, <laughs> is a drafting game um, like Sushi Go or something. And I, I like Blood Rage quite a bit, but it's a lot like Sushi Go. Uh, but in order to make it, seem like a war game you've got to have like ripped people and like blood everywhere and it's got and a very like, dark look so there's a question about like do you want your aesthetic like if it, 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 there's always an, a relationship between the aesthetic and the mechanism and you know when i think about blood rage as an instance of the art like doing a lot of the thematic lifting and making the game more violent and then in root the art is pulling the game back <laughs> Um, and yeah. I think bo both approaches can work really well, but th this is the, the real privilege of having someone like Kyle on staff is that we can hash these things out, like even before the first play test happens. And, and to go even further off of that, if you look at what I'm working on in the studio right now, because I'm, you know, I, like it says, it says I designed the expansion, but like I'm, I'm, I'm past it. I'm working on, I'm working on whatever we're doing in a year right now, because that's, that's the, where we have to be pace wise, if it takes us 18 months to make something. And like the one of the projects I'm I'm trying out and I'm playtesting right now is something that that Kyle brought to us, and said I want to work with this, like I don't think he said I want to work with the style. He said let's make this sort of title, and this is the style that we can work with for it. And then I have been basing my design off of like those suggestions, and it's been it's been an interesting experiment. I, like Cole and I talk a lot about how liberating uh, limitations are, and by having you know, we'd, we'd already been talking about it, it, and like some of this comes out of a discussion we had with Vast about what we're gonna do with the Vast line going forward. And and there was like, well, we can we can make it into this thing as, as you know, we like we could continue Vast and there's a couple things that we can make it into. And so this this game is from that that process of like, 
you know, if we if we strip down Vast to these elements and and focus on just a few pieces, and then uh, and then Kyle's able, Kyle came in with, well, let's have the form factor be this, and let's have the art look like this. And I've been working with it, but working with limitations has been very liberating because now I don't have my full creative, um, you know, mood to work with. I, I have a very specific. Well, I need to make this style of game that works with a very few number of pieces, and that's what I'm working right now. So, and so. I think, yeah, Kyle's got just an exceptional amount of input in, in that process. And even when we we're working on Vast before Cole joined us, there was a group document where we talked about the theme and the theme of each, you know, the goblins and the knight and, and the cave and how those fit together and, and what each group represented. Um, and so I, I think we've always been pretty pretty engaged with that. <laughs> I love the, the, the really deep integration of the aesthetic into the design of the game. That's so... Um, I mean, like you guys said, it's just, it helps um, with that tone when you're playing the game. I, it, that's very cool. Thank you for sharing about that. <laughs> um, I wanted to get us back to a little bit of a more basic question for some of our uh, viewers who might not be board game geeks as much or might not be familiar with the root. Can you tell us a little bit about what an asymmetric game is? Uh, so an asymmetric game um, for us is a game in which the players play by different rules, but are interacting in the same spaces. Um, I think Netrunner, the Android Netrunner, is a good is a great example of it in that the corp is building a defensive structure to protect their secrets or their cards in the game, which have their points on them, and the other player is. Uh, is trying to infiltrate that system and, and grab the cards from that player. And so they're interacting in the same way. They both have strength. You know, the defenses have a certain strength and the way that they get in has a certain strength to it. And they, they communicate with the same language of actions, which is called clicks, I think, and bits is the currency in that game. Um, but they also are playing a very fundamentally different game and control it. Uh, the pace is very different for both players, the, the runner uh, player again, that's fighting the corp. Has a very uh, different sense of, um, of they, they get to control the pace of the game, uh, and so for us it's 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 different. Like for Vast, it's different fact, it's different roles. For Root, it's different. Or we call them roles or factions in the end. Uh, in, in Root, we call them factions. Factions, thank but you. Vast is roles. <laughs> it's okay. It's a player position. Uh, it's a player <laughs> position. Yeah, and so uh, and so for Root, Root, it's uh, what what it, what your faction is communicating to you is how you're going to score points. And that is linked to your theme and how you're going, what, what sort of turn you're going to have to, to score those points. Root has a lot more common uh, ground between the roles so that the, or between the factions, excuse me, so that the uh, movement all works generally kind of the same way and combat all works kind of the same way. And there's only one deck of cards that works the same way for most of the players. So. Cole, you want to pick that up? Anything you want to add? Yeah, to that? well, I mean, I'll just, I, I think, you know, one thing I want to underline is that this is a very different way. Like if we think about the fact that games can kind of tell stories in their own way, this is a very different narrative approach. Um, it's a little bit like imagining a novel where, you know, one chapter might be done in the first person and another chapter might be done in the second. And maybe another chapter is done like from the perspective of a crowd with a lot of like, I don't know, roving stream of consciousness like Mrs. Dalloway or something. I mean, these are like very different, like we're essentially putting different kinds of narrative approaches next to each other and then letting them, as Patrick said, like interact in the same space. And so what the penalty that you have to pay for that is the games are a little harder to learn. But what you get from it is a much more immersive and deeper game experience where there's just a lot more ways that the, um, the positions can interact with each other because not every person is the hero. Awesome. I think that like two huge takeaways, at least for chat to, to sort of like hear from this, what I hear is like game design is, you know, on the, on the pieces of the pie, the actual like, you know, roll dice or pick cards is, is only a slice to what story are we trying to tell? How are we trying to tell it? What does that look like? How does it make people feel? It's a much more cognitive emotional experience and I think the average person probably looks at board game design as, as like a job or a career or anything like that it's much more creative so very very cool thank you for sharing Aaron you, you want to bring up another question 
Yeah, I, I just, because Root is already such a deep game and, um, you know, you have the Kickstarter going for Marauder right now and, and Riverfolk came out. Um, do, how, how do you know, like, when a game is complete or how do you know when you're kind of approaching completion on a game? Um, I'm just so curious. Well, I, I mean, it's a hard thing to know, right? There, that old saw about how works aren't finished, just abandoned is true pretty much in every field. But I, there is a line though. I think that there is a, there, there's a point where you kind of stop needing to change something where you, you might play a game and say, well, I actually don't have any adjustments I wanna make after this. And you play it again and you keep coming to that same conclusion. Uh, now, be, because we're on tight schedules, we often don't get to dwell on that very, very often, right? So <laughs> I mean, usually, um, as will be, you know, we, we always have development schedules. And so I, I might ask someone who's working on a project, uh, maybe they have a month left in what we'd call like a hot development phase. And I'll, I'll go to them and say, like, do you think you need more time? And they'll say, no, if you, th if you were to like map out the changes, it seems like we're changing a little bit less each week. And within maybe four or five weeks, we'll be done. And and so it, it it winds down. Like I there's there's a funny thing about like inertia when it comes to uh, working on big projects like these, where in certain phases you'll find yourself changing big chunks of the rules. Every game, you won't even get through a game without changing it. You might say, okay, you know, first first half of the session, this part is all broke. I'm just gonna make a little a change on the fly and then we'll try to finish the game to see if we can get some good information. But then what happens is as the longer you work on the game, you just stop having to do that. And maybe you made a couple changes after, after playing one or two times, or maybe you didn't make any changes at all. So at, at times like that, I mean, so I had an interesting thing happen this summer when I was working on Oath because we've been working on Oath for a really long time. And I saw the, the development schedule winding down. And I, I, I knew that, and having, having gone on this ride before, I knew that I needed to stop fiddling with the design. Uh, and so as, as like I got closer to that, that final date, I, just, I stopped making big changes to the design. And then uh, because of, of COVID and some other kind of scheduling mishaps, suddenly there was an extra like two and a half months added to the development period. We just found some time basically. Uh, and I had a, a strange moment where even though in my mind I had said, well, this is done and ready to go, we just paused and did like an audit of the entire design. And there were a couple parts that like didn't ring quite true. And so we went back and used that two months to like fix those things and make the game a little stronger. Uh, and I think there, there's a danger where if you don't have a mechanism to stop yourself from doing that audit, that you'll never finish anything because you just want to keep going back to it. But I think as long as you've got somebody, you know, who, who will tap you on your shoulder and say like, I think it's about done. I think it's time to, you know, just, just move on to the next thing. That's why Cole's on the staff. He tells <laughs> me I'm roll. done. He tells me I'm done, or Josh tells me I'm done, and I go, "Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go do something else. I'll play Doom." <laughs> you, you don't. You don't want to overcook it, right? I mean, I yeah, think in, absolutely. In the same yep. way that you can always tell if like a movie or if a novel has been kind of like over edited and just overcooked, and it doesn't have like the same vibrancy of you know as maybe a, another another entry or something. And so I think in development, uh, one of the things I love about working at a game company is when we play games, other companies publish games, we get to critique them and not tell anybody about our critiques. And what one thing that I'm always very sensitive to is like, do I think this design was cooked too much? Was it kind of like overbalanced? Um, and I think when you look at like real classics in board gaming, uh, games like, I don't know, Axis and Allies or Cosmic Encounter, there's a scrappiness to them where like, I know they didn't spend like a decade working on the very first Cosmic Encounter pack. It has a real vibrancy to it. Um, and, you know, that's the, exactly the kind of game that could have been killed with, with, with too much cooking at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> we have a great question from chat about Root. It says the game is ages for ages 10 plus. Is how, how, how easy, difficult is it at, is it for kids to pick up? Are there kind of like simpler tracks that kids can use? Kids and adults play together. What's your thoughts? Uh, I have a seven-year-old, so I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I probably, I, I feel like someone in our audience can answer that better than I can. Um, 
about about who can play it or not but i've heard i know kids play it quite a bit i think um i'm just getting to the point where i'm playing with my kid uh how do you feel about that cole i also have a seven-year-old although mine is a younger seven-year-old than yours (laughs) yeah Um, mine's mine's almost an eight-year-old yeah (laughs) yeah mine is newly a seven-year-old i think owen is i think next year he'll probably be ready Mm -hmm. you you have to you, you have to be able to read and i think some factions are a lot easier than others so a, a seven-year-old could probably do pretty well with the cats, uh, which are in the kind of base set, and could probably do the birds. In fact, I, sometimes you, you see kids really like get attached to that kind of like progr- programmatic thinking. Uh, the, the birds have a funny mechanism where you kind of have to plan your, your turns ahead. Uh, and one of the things that's nice about that is even though it requires planning, it also uh, frees you from having to worry about like a lot of tactical decisions because half of your turn has already been chosen for you by what you did last turn. Um, so I think th- there are some factions that are a lot better for people who are younger. And, um, you know, someone who's in fourth or fifth grade could certainly pick up most of the factions in the game. Uh, Kyle just said in chat, his kid is 10. And now I feel ancient. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Um, I, for me also i would see like maybe see i i i'm the opposite i think i'd probably give my daughter if my wife and i were playing the vagabond to play because if she influences the game state in a weird way it's not like it's not as disrupting uh and and you can recover very quickly as a vagabond if you have the if you have a bad turn or whatever so uh we still we we're still fighting for that length of game we i think we'd still be fighting touch and spans though so i think we'd we probably play something a little bit lighter. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, that's great. So reading comprehension is important. Uh, you know, seven to 10 is kind of the youngest age, but definitely some like, I would say like a great way to explore what kind of games your kid or like what kind of faction your kid likes might be a good way to see what sort of games they like to play otherwise. Cause it sounds like they all have like slightly different approaches and mechanics, so. Yeah, and I, you know, any, 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 I would say this is a good like next step if, if your child like plays Catan. Okay. Yeah. This is like a great next step. Perfect. Awesome. (laughs) Other questions, Aaron? What do you got? I mean, I, I feel like I should have been taking a journal full of notes while, while, while this is going on. Um, I know after. (laughs) Of course. Aaron asked so many questions. Um, if you could, like, if you could adopt any novel into a game, you know, World Builders works with so many authors and so many, and so many books. Um, is there any book that you're reading right now that where you're like, this could make a really great game and I'd love to adapt that one day? We just, we just did this on Twitter, Cole, didn't we? What was yours? Oh, I don't know if I, oh, who did I have? I, um, I can do mine first. If you, you do want. yours so first and okay. I'm going to stew on, because I've got a couple that I'd do. <laughs> so I, I would do the, um, I would take the like 2000, the style of the 2000 Lord of the Rings board game of like just hitting the narrative elements of, of Lord of the Rings and fitting into it kind of this card management system that represents the, the virtue of the character, the hobbits, you know, in Lord of the Rings. And I would take that and, and maybe not focus on virtue, but um, I would do Neuromancer from William Gibson, the 1984 uh, novel Neuromancer, uh, about the, the three characters' journey um, through the story of, of trying to bring uh, Winter Mute and Neuromancer back together. Ooh, uh, spoilers for Neuromancer. Um, <laughs> 1984. <laughs> um, about trying to bring the two AIs back together so they can become one complete being. Uh, you know whether that is uh, you know self motivated or if it is just the way that they're built or you know of course that's a question in the novel right or if uh, and it was it right or wrong to bring them back together. Uh, you, you can answer that on your own, but. Uh, I would I would just focus on that action and then have like each character uh, presented in a way that um, not in a like traditional like you've betrayed the group like in Battlestar Galactica or in Merwolf, but like the character itself will have a failing, have a moral failing or some sort of technical failing in the story. And you know, so you'd have to get a little bit ahistorical with the with the ahistorical, if you will, with the novel and and present like other things that could have happened to the characters in the story. 
um, and about their failings, and then how do you work that into still completing the mission? And, but it's not it's not a betrayal in the sense that like now that player is working against the rest of the group. It is just their character failing, and how does the group uh, bring uh, still still bring the mission to a completion with with that failing going on? So, well, now I want that. So thanks. <laughs> Can you add that um, to your list. Just like yeah. put it on the development list. For the next. I uh, I will I I'll reach out to uh, William Gibson's agent today. I don't think that's going to happen though. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never yeah. know. Yeah. Tell him World Builder sent you. There Maybe, was you know, a, just might free it up. There was a video game in the late eighties uh, about a case or um, about him, you know, like his hacking and and you could. It was pretty brutal, but anyway, go ahead, Cole. What was uh, yours? Was, uh, it, it's so I don't know. I always find the adaptation question so interesting because we have, like, we get offers occasionally from creators we really respect who want to make a board game version of their thing, and it always makes me so anxious uh, because you really, uh, I I love books, but books are books. It's a it's a hard thing to like move from one form to another in a way that feels like it captures the the spirit of the work i actually think neuromancer would be is an interesting candidate because there are things about it that uh just lend itself really well to opposition and the kinds of like systems that are within it that are within a game uh i mean uh, in, in some respects i feel like when we're, we're doing our work jobs really well it feels like we're building like little um I don't know, sandboxes for playwrights and people are like riffing on like little, they're creating little improv sets that might be riffing on themes and something else. Um, so, you know, when I'm working on design, I, I read a lot and I'm always thinking about, it's, it's funny, I actually read through the Patrick Rothfuss's novels for Oath because I hadn't read a, a fantasy novel written in the past 20 years. And I thought, oh, well, the, I'm gonna start with these and tear through them. And they, uh, they, were, they were lovely and gave me a lot of thoughts about like, how a world can be created, hinted at, understood, viewed. Uh, and then the other books that are really, really important for Oath were um, the, the Puritan books by Lloyd Alexander, The Black Cauldron and that set. And, and so I spent a lot of time like just kind of sorting through those books and thinking about like their morality and how they're structured and like what parts of that world lend itself to, to a game. But Oath isn't really like an adaptation of those books. It, it has allusions to them and it, it, you can even recreate some of the same like narrative settings. Um, there are, uh, I don't know, there are a lot of uh, worlds that I think I would love to sort of like play in. I want somebody desperately to adapt N.K. Jemisin's brilliant uh, fifth <laughs> season in, in that series, the Broken Earth books into something. Um, every Kim Stanley you know, Robinson okay, novel okay. needs like a sci-fi miniseries, please. That'd be great, uh, would appreciate that. Uh, and I think all of those like really, really just like lend themselves to um, really interesting, like it sounds so bad to call something a derivative work, even though like that's precisely what you're doing because you're building a work that is derived, derived from something else. But uh, they're, they're, those, the, a lot of those works are so powerful that you want to see a lot of derivative work around them. You want to see a lot of people sort of like fleshing out and building out that, that initial creation. Yeah, I would love for derivative work not to be have any negative connotation yeah. with it at all. I mean, we're, you know, we're also we're, there's like the copyright and the, you know, who gets paid for their creativity side of things, which is important, but like as if I create something, somebody taking it and running with it is like the most exciting thing for me. And so I think derivative works are amazing and yeah, as our as our geek in the van points out, it could be argued that almost everything is kind right, of everything. Uh, Star Wars is derivative of Kurosawa, so right. and yeah. people like Star Wars, so yeah, I, it's fine. Uh, after I finished this game about Afghanistan, I did um, called Pax Premier. A person made a fan game called Pax Expanse, where they basically took the engine that I had built and adapted it to the Expanse novels, and it's <laughs> amazing. And like, I, I was so happy to see it. And I was like, you are welcome to post this. And as soon as the IP holder tells you to put pull it down, please pull it down. I'm not sanctioning <laughs> this in one way or another, right. um, but like, it is just an, a remarkable thing. And I'm, I'm just overjoyed to see that it exists. There's a Witcher what? root also. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, someone took uh, the, and it's, it's one for one. Like it's, it's not, it's not right. like a, it's not like a, cause I think uh, the expanse you were talking about, like, they took the system, but they kind of designed their own cards and their own world. Right? Yeah, they added some yeah. stuff to it. Yeah, whereas The Witcher is just straight up, you know, the 
the Witcher is this vagabond and has the same mechanics as the. Um, uh, I think maybe they did give the variable play powers with the vagabond. They were a little bit different, but everything else is mm-hmm. the 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 player that's analogous to the birds it acts exactly like the birds. So, so it's just, out there. Uh, and I'm they contacted us, Cavill. and I, I said, I said what Cole said. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, you go right ahead, and at some point, someone from uh, that studio is going to tell you to take it down, and, and that'll yeah. be it. But, Aaron, I want to know your answer to that question because you also design games. What world do you want to play in? What sandbox would be your dream? Uh, uh, based on a novel? Novel uh, or gosh. movie show? Any sort of creative IP? Um, I've always wanted to do like an organization or drafting game based on high fidelity and records. Uh, I love I love the power of of music. I like music in a lot of my games. And I would love to take the like uh, the idiosyncratic routines that Rob Gordon has in High Fidelity and make that into like an organization game because uh, it feels like it would really tie in well to who he is as a character. He's kind of an awful person, so but also I think that'd be fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak mine at the end. That's amazing. Uh, I would do Max Mad Max Fury Road. Oh my goodness. Kind of the opposite of like an organizational (laughs) game. Just try like chaos and, you know, like getting from point A to point B and everything goes wrong on the way kind of game. Uh, I love that movie. And I think it would be really interesting, like thinking about it from the perspective, like you guys were talking about of art aesthetic and, and the story being told, influencing the way the game plays. I could see it just being really uh, both like fast paced, intense. Um, Yeah. So more Furiosa everywhere, please. Yes, always. I had a, um, I've been working on a a strange project, uh, which is a deduction game. So I love murder mystery novels and murder mystery movies. And I would love to do that in a board game format, because even though like one of the foundational modern board games is Clue, Clue does not feel like an Agatha Christie novel. It doesn't really feel like, it feels like you're doing a Sudoku. Uh, and so I want like to figure out a way of building a deduction game that captures like the paranoia and the, the sleuthing that is like the at the cor- corner of like any pro novel or something like that. Uh, and it, it's really interesting to adapt that because what ends up happening is when I get stuck, I find myself being like, oh, well, let's just have like weapon and motive and room or something. And you got to figure out those things. And then as soon as I do that, I'm like, no, this isn't the right way to approach this kind of narrative space. It's just where I happened you know, to stumble in too. And I think, you know, the only games, in my opinion, the only games that really capture that genre well are like Werewolf in that, I, which I think do like a game of Werewolf feels much closer to a classic detective story than almost any game with that explicit theme. Well, it's it's what you don't know, right? In Werewolf, you are constantly trying to do the the math in your head. It's that, it's that meme where everyone's mm-hmm. seeing all the equations uh, and then near the end, there's always that moment of, ah, I did it, or, oh, I was so entirely off base. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Uh, Aaron, do you have other questions? I've got a couple just like rapid fire <laughs> I, ones. I have had so many questions. I feel like I've monopolized your time. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> not at all, not at all. No, this has been a great conversation. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left. So if anyone in chat has uh, questions, feel free to shout them out. The folks uh, have chat open so we can all see and reply. Uh, but we'll just keep on going. So similar, what uh, do you have any great novel, fantasy novel, sci-fi, whatever, geeky books, shows, movies that have been particularly inspirational to you lately? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna Give find out. I, I don't read much. Doom <laughs> like, too. <laughs> I don't read. I I've, I just um I don't read much lately, and it's it's a, a great failing. I I started reading Altered Carbon like a couple weeks ago, and I have not gotten that far into it. Mostly because I figured it out on page thirty. It's a mystery, and I I was just like, well, I know the ending, so this this is kind of demotivating. Uh, but Cole reads a lot, so Cole, go for it. <laughs> I do. Um, let's see, what am I reading right now? I have been, okay, so I'm going to give you uh, the weirdest recommendation I could possibly give 
just Love knowing it. this organization's affili affiliation with Patrick Rothfuss, I, I'm going to hope that at least someone appreciates the strangeness of this recommendation. So over the summer, I read Robert Caro's books about Lyndon Johnson, which are called The Life and Times of Lyndon Johnson. They are perhaps, they have them perhaps the most boring covers of any book you will ever see in your life. Uh, the first book is called The Path to Power. And they are startling and beautiful and so compellingly written. Basically, everyone took about, each of these volumes took like 15 years to write. And they're this incredibly detailed history of the 20th century and of Lyndon Johnson, who I know no one cares about. But why, here's the connection to Rothfuss. Uh, my wife and I listened to The Name of the Wind on audiobook. And it was just kind of always playing in our house because I listened to it and then she listened to it again and then I listened to it again. And it was just kind of like always on while we were doing dishes or something. And when I was listening to these Johnson books, she walked in and thought that I, we were, I was listening to The Name of the Wind. And she's like, I don't remember this part. <laughs> and it's because they are both trickster stories and the main characters are so manipulative and also kind of charming, but also kind of monstrous. And you just kind of get wrapped into them. And I think they're fabulous. And even folks who don't normally read history they're excellent, excellent reads. Um, for something a little more normal, oh gosh. I love I, the weird recommendation. Why did I yeah, say, why did I lead with that? Um, <laughs> what, what have I read that is normal lately? Um, uh, well, I'll give you a, uh, a, a, okay, I'll give one more novel, a very beautiful novel that I admire, um, call, that, that's, that is really interesting, called The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker, which is a story of the uh, Iliad retold from the perspective of Achilles's mistress. It's yes. startling and brilliant and every line is just beautifully composed. Uh, and then for a movie recommendation, I'll give you a very odd one that I watched last night with my daughter uh, while I was just waiting for her to fall asleep. We watched a uh, animated movie called Kirikou and the Sorceress, which is set, I think in West Africa and it is beautiful and charming and uh, hilarious it's a it's a french animated film uh highly highly recommended so those are my my fast recommendations wait we were allowed to do movies you're allowed <laughs> to do movies <laughs> watch lots of movies don't worry all types of media are encouraged and welcomed but i, do, I still my read poetry I, recommendation. Just don't read, I just don't read novels <laughs> is, yeah. is my problem <laughs> but it, my wife and i watch a movie every day um pretty much all right so uh, there's a movie um, I really, a horror movie, we've watched a lot of horror uh, that I really like called Mandy. And it does Ugh. suffer, it does suffer from um, your girlfriends in the refrigerator, like, cause it's, it's, you know, it's a revenge film, but um, my, the visual storytelling, I, it just uh, like how much, how much has worked into every shot for such a low budget film. Like the, the, the person that, uh, the, the, the point of the camera the, uh, and, and the director were paying so much attention to what you were seeing at every moment on the screen. And it's one of those movies where you can pause any moment and be like, yeah, this is something's going on here. And I just, it's gory and violent and there's a chainsaw fight in it, you know? So like, like you know, take that for what you will. Uh, if, you, if you're not comfortable with gore, definitely don't watch it. But uh, um, I, my wife has desensitized me over the last 10 years, so I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, and so I, I just, I, 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 it's an amazing movie. I really like it. I, I watched it like as soon as we watched it, I watched it again and I bought it immediately because, um, you know, like at this point, like they didn't get a theater release, so it was just like I, I got to support this this studio, so I went and bought it. <clears throat> and Nicholas Cage, like, and Nick Cage being my full goodness, Nick Cage. yeah, 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 like the, just they... looking at the camera going, yeah, <laughs> just cranking the Nick Cageness up to yep. eleven on that one. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. I think it's really interesting. I don't know, we don't have time to do a super deep dive, but Cole, you were talking about uh, one of the books you were talking about as a retelling of the Il Iliad, I think. It feels like, you know, kind of on the topic of derivative works, that there's been a bit of a resurgence of adapting those older games, older stories. There's like Hades, the game right now, video game, um, a lot of like classic mythology um, Circe was a book from a, a couple of years ago that's been hugely mm -hmm. popular. Uh, and I think it's very cool that people are tapping into some of these older stories and saying, what's a way we could tell this in a new way? What's a new perspective we can add to this existing story? So it's very cool to see. 
Yeah, and for folks interested in that sort of thing, the new um, Headley translation of Beowulf is really wonderful and charming. Ooh. Okay. So if you've never, if you've never, you know, had a reason to read that long and strange thing, uh, the new translation is extremely <laughs> funny, and it is well, well worth your time. Awesome, awesome. Um, cool. Oh, there was one question from chat that I wanted to get in. It's a little bit of a specific one to us and our community, because we're note takers and pen geeks. <laughs> we're taking a little bit of a left turn into actually how you design games and how you work do you have favorite a favorite note taking method journal pen or are you just whatever is nearby there you go <laughs> back of napkins <laughs> <laughs> He's oh. got it. <laughs> i have the same pens i use yeah i order z grips by the box now apparently and um i just i just like how i like the speed of them i like how they write and they don't get stuck on anything. And then my wife made me these notebooks, which are like my leader game spiral notebook. I have a lot of journals around too um, that I, I filled up with writing. And I always carry, um, I mean, because of the COVID, because of the COVID, because of COVID, I'm not going out of the house as much, but I usually have a moleskin underneath my phone in my pocket. So it's um, it's always there to write on. Mine's, my current one's full, so. Cole, what do you do for notes? I uh, I have a little, this is actually the little one that has all of the root play tests back from Ooh. 2017. Uh, it's mostly just lists and a thing like this. Um, I, it's so fun. I usually don't refer back to my notes. I write them out because it helps me remember them. And it's also, it allows me to throw them away. Like I, it, it, I, I basically, I'm forgiving myself for never looking back at this <laughs> note by recording it onto the paper. And I'll say, I'm discarding this idea. You're not going into the living thing, but at least I recorded you somewhere. Um, I use pencils. I'm 100% a Dixon Ticonderoga stan. Uh, I picked up this habit because when you work in a, in a research library, you can't bring in pens. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of legal, legal pads and pencils. That's pretty much all. Um, I don't think I know you use. anymore. <laughs> it's true. I only use pencils. I'm a huge, I mean, I have a pen here, but I there's it's hard. And so I, both of our notebooks are filled with this. I, I'm suspecting, which is just yeah. pages and pages of of this is what the card should look like, and this is what, or, or more theoretical. I mean, we both probably don't do that too. But yeah, I do a lot. I, I will say, in general, um, writing is like a huge part of my creative process i write thousands of words each day on average just while while i'm in while i'm in a project because i have to describe it to someone to myself um and it, it's it's there and so what will usually happen is i will start writing something and if i really pick up speed and i'm starting to get very interested in it i switch to something where i can type faster um because you know it's it slows you down but sometimes that that slowness is really important i had a i had a teacher once who was so committed to doing first drafts in longhand because she hated it. And it forced her to really think about every word because you just had to slow herself down. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's I right. love the the name draft for Dixon Ticonderoga as well. We're going to get that sponsorship for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason I, I'll say one more thing about those silly pencils. Uh, I worked at a Korean cram school for many years and uh, I don't think I bought a pencil for the six years I worked there because they just had stacks and boxes <laughs> of those of those Ticonderogas everywhere. And I just ran out the other day. I, I reached into my glove box and I saw that I only had half a pencil left in there. So I had to buy my first <laughs> box of pencils in probably a decade. A weird That's end a, of an era, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> As a Cole, Cole turned me on to the technique also of just opening up Illustrator and creating kind of a big multi artboard like thing that that shows what you're working on and, and shows the relationship between everything and also i mean like i hate to say it but i've just been doing a lot of like whatever the google powerpoint is presentation where i just lay out because i'll be talking about something and cole i will bravely go i know i don't know what you're talking about or and most other people on the staff just kind of look at me like i wish i knew what you were talking about but i can't see it so i've been working on i just put together presentations to pitch everything now one of my one of my dearest friends is an absolute genius and she was like i was struggling to figure out why it's so much harder for me to write presentations or write papers than it is a presentation but then i just wrote my paper in powerpoint and it's fine and then i just take it all out and 
reformat it, but you know, do what works for you kind of thing. Yeah. So we are, we are coming close to our end of time. Thank you guys so, so, so much for guesting with us. It has just been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I know Aaron feels the same. Letting you, if you have anything to say. Um, just wanted but, to say thank you for your time and your work. I mean, your, your games are obviously uh, filling quite a few shelves in my library and uh just just probably so many so many game nights of joy so thank you so much for for joining us today you're very, you're very welcome absolutely and for those in chat the marauder expansion is currently being kick-started so if you've never played root before it's a great time you can get the base game you can sign up for the expansion um and just kind of check it out uh it's uh it's available in the World Builders Market, the original store. And if you buy it in the market, you get a calendar print. So don't forget that. Um, so wonderful to see everybody next week. Tune in next week, Tuesday at noon central time. We are chatting with Machine Hood author SB Divya. So another great, great guest to look forward to. Um, if you have suggestions, ideas, requests for different guests, if you'd like to see Leader Games back on, just hit us up in our DMs, send me an email, whatever. And uh, we are happy to, we, we want World Builders Weekly to be fun and interesting for you guys. So just let us know what you want to see. Don't forget to check out World Builders Market. Um, and if you, uh, oh, I just, <laughs> my brain stuttered on our, our <laughs> script there. Whew, it's, it's been an hour, hasn't it? Um, Questions at worldbuilders.org is a great place to send any of those questions or requests that you have. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Gray, our geek in the van, and Beth, Lincoln in chat. Very, very great. And it's time for our ritual sign off. Uh, every week we have a um, different word that we make up on the fly to have chat tell us so we know that the delay has caught up and we're not cutting off the conversation. And today the game, the name is Viva Games. Viva Moose, Viva Games. Yes. Viva Moose. Viva there Games. it is. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. Bye y'all. <laughs>